With their 7-6 win over the Yankees in the home opener on Friday, it looked like the Orioles' offense was continuing to roll. But that all changed in the final two games of the series, as the O's' offense just kind of went away, and they dropped two out of three to New York over the weekend. I'll recap the Orioles' series loss coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, April 10th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, I'm going to recap the Orioles' series loss to the Yankees over the weekend. They open up the home season with a win on Friday, which I broke down on Friday evening's episode of the pod. Make sure to go back and check that one out. But the series finished with two losses in which the Orioles' offense just was non-existent against Yankee pitching, and the O's dropped back under 500 and dropped their first home series of the year. I'll get you the five things you need to know from Saturday's loss, the five things you need to know from Sunday's loss, and then we'll talk a bit about the interesting roster move that the Orioles made before Sunday's game. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Ultimate Baseball GM. Ever dreamed of becoming an MLB GM and managing your baseball franchise? Then this game is definitely for you. To download the game, just visit ultimatebaseballgm.com or look it up on the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game. So Orioles and Yankees this weekend from Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It was fun on Friday for the home opener. The O's beat the Yankees 7-6. I recapped it on Friday's episode. Wasn't as fun the next two days. I was in the ballpark Saturday. It was cold. The Orioles' offense was cold. They fell 4-1. to one. Then Sunday wasn't much better. They fall 5-3 to three and drop 2 out of 3 in their home opening series against the Yankees. Orioles now 4-5 and five on the season. And I'm going to get you the recaps from both games. We'll start with Saturday. The five things you need to know from the Orioles' 4-1 to one loss to the Yankees on Saturday. And the first thing you need to know is that Cole Irvin just... In his two starts so far with the Orioles, and especially in his start on Saturday night, he just has not yet done what the Orioles brought him over here to do. His job, when the Orioles traded for him this offseason, sent Daryl Hernandez over to Oakland, was to come over and be an innings eater who threw strikes. Now, that meant sometimes he could throw seven scoreless. That meant sometimes he might give up four runs over six or seven innings. But generally, you knew he was going to give you six-plus innings every single time he went out there. Because that's essentially what he did over 30 starts with the Athletics last season. Well, it hasn't happened this year for Cole Irvin. It it, it just simply hasn't. His start on Saturday night, four and two-thirds innings. He allowed three runs on four hits with five strikeouts and four walks. No home runs allowed, but it took him 101 pitches and he couldn't even get through five innings. Six hard hit balls against him from the Yankee lineup. And the walks were the big issue. Cole Irvin just has not walked guys in his career. He has only walked four batters in a start twice before in his entire career. And he got to the big leagues with the Phillies in 2019. And he only has two previous starts before Saturday where he walked four guys. It's tough to see. I mean, he only had one start last season out of 30 with the A's where he walked four. That was September 6th against Atlanta. Went four and two-thirds, gave up nine runs on nine hits, walked four and struck out four. And then 2021, also just one game with four walks that year. It was against the White Sox in August, and it was actually a a pretty good start. Three runs over six innings, but 1K and four walks. So this tied a career high, and it was only the third time he had done it in his career. And then you look at how long he lasted in the game. I mean, four and two-thirds innings, throwing 101 pitches. Irvin, again, made 30 starts for Oakland last year. Only three of those 30 starts lasted lasted less than five innings. And in only five of those 30 starts, did he fail to record at least one out in the sixth inning? Irvin has failed to do that in both of his Orioles starts so far, which means it's small sample, but he's on pace to not be as good as he was for the A's last year. And it's not like the O's are counting on Cole Irvin to be their ace. 
but they need him to be better than this. And at the very least, I tweeted this out on Saturday night. If he's going to give up three or four runs, that's fine. As long as he goes six or seven innings. But when you're going four and two thirds, when your bullpen is looking a little dicey and dealing with injuries right now, they need Cole Irvin to be the innings eater. And he talked about it after the game. He owned up to it. He said, I know the Orioles brought me in to you know, pitch into the seventh inning and beyond. I just haven't done it so far in the two starts. But he needs to pick it up because that is what they got him for. And he's out here and he's basically just firing fastballs at the Yankees. I mean, 101 pitches. He threw 51 four-seamers. And he's 92-93 with the pitch, which was a little up on the velocity. But, I mean, 10 whiffs on 54 swings. Yankees putting the ball in play all over the place. He was basically just fastball, changeup, curveball all day. It just wasn't effective, and he didn't have command of any of his pitches. You just can't have that from Cole Irvin moving forward. Second thing you need to know from this one is that Austin Voth, coming out of the bullpen, struggled again for the Orioles. Now, the end of his line only showed one run allowed as he relieved Cole Irvin in the fifth inning of Saturday's game, ended up going two innings in relief, allowing one run on two hits with a strikeout, no walks, and a home run. The first uh, batter he faced was Giancarlo Stanton, who hit an absolute missile off of both in the fifth inning of that game that extended the Yankee lead to four to one at the time. And when I mean absolute missile, it was kind of ridiculous, especially being in the ballpark, how fast that ball got out of here. Stanton hit it 116.3 miles per hour, traveling 436 feet over the big wall in left field for a solo shot. Not a good day for Austin Voth. And he did rebound to get six more outs without giving up another run. But he was a little lucky, I have to say. I mean, he still gave up three hard-hit balls. The stuff was not crisp. And through three outings, again, it's three outings, but it's a 10.38 ERA so far for Austin Voth. And we are not seeing the pitcher we saw in the second half last year with the Orioles. We're seeing more the pitcher we saw with the Nationals for the last couple of seasons in this Austin Voth reliever type. And maybe he works better in a starter role, but you have to feel like his days are numbered if he keeps pitching like this. And maybe the Orioles just did a great job to squeeze out, you know, a, a good half season out of both last year. And that's all he had left because it looked like his career was cooked, you know, at the end of that run with the Nationals when they DFA'd him early last season. And a good job by the Orioles kind of tweaking his stuff and, and turning him into a good starter down the stretch. But that's not what he is right now. He's a bad reliever right now. He's not helping the Orioles bullpen. And that's something to monitor. He is out of options, so you would have to DFA him, but something to look at because it has not been good for Austin Both. Third thing you need to know from this one is that Taron Vavra got the start in right field for the Orioles in this game, hitting ninth. And he did play a good right field, tracked down everything, made a really nice diving catch out there early in the game. But also on the flip side, he was 0 for 3 with two strikeouts. And Vavra, yeah, he's not playing every day, but he's hitting 125 now so far this season. So a little bit concerning about Taron Vavra, but. I liked that he's kind of adjusted well. He's looked good in right and left field when he's played the outfield this year. We know he can play second base. Third base has been solid, at least in spring training. That's nice to see. You need him to do a little more hitting, which he's not doing right now, but hopefully if there's more playing time available for him, he will start to do that. Fourth thing you need to know, speaking of the offense, the Oriole offense really did nothing in this game. And after they had had some big games in Boston and against Texas, and they scored the seven runs in the home opening win on Friday, it was just one run on four hits for the Orioles on Saturday. And it was kind of bleak. I mean, the game started off well. Cedric Mullins singled, Adley Rutschman singled, Santander hit a sack fly, put the Orioles up one nothing immediately in the bottom of the first inning. And then they basically got nothing else for the rest of the game. They only got two more hits for the final eight innings of this one. And listen, Johnny Brito, the rookie starter for the Yankees, he's got good stuff, but it was his second big league start. And he goes five innings of one run ball. It's not like he was super dominant. I mean, it was only two strikeouts in five innings, but he just got soft contact. The Orioles didn't square anything up. And then the O's only got three base runners in four innings against the Yankee bullpen, the combination of Michael King, Wandy Peralta, and Clay Holmes. Now, to be fair, that's probably the Yankees' three best healthy relievers right now, but still, the O's got basically nothing against those three guys, and it just turned out to be a bad, bad offensive performance. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 4-1 to loss to the Yankees on Saturday is that at least Adley Rutschman was the one guy who kind of did something in this game offensively. I mentioned he had a single 
in the first inning, kind of a liner that hit off Brito, ricocheted into left field for a base hit. That was his only hit. He was one for two with that single and a strikeout, but he also walked twice in the game. So Rutschman reaching base three times. And he did reach base three times, but still was the only Oriole to reach base more than once in this game. Mullins had the one for four with a single. You had Adam Frazier one for four with a single. Ramon Rios one for four with a single. And then Kyle Stowers and Gunnar Henderson each drew a walk in that game, but did not have a hit either of them. And that was it. The Orioles only totaled seven hard hit balls in nine innings. It was just nothing from the offense. And hey, you know, the the pitching was, I mean, it was a little better after Irvin left. And you know, both was a, a little shaky. Keegan Aiken and Mike Bauman combined for two and a third scoreless out of the pen. They just, nothing from the offense. And that's going to lead to a loss against this Yankee team. But the Orioles still had a chance because they won Friday to turn it around and still win a series on Sunday and, and start the home season off on the right foot. But the offensive struggles just continued into Sunday and it ended up with another loss and a series loss. And coming up next, I'll break down Sunday's loss to the Yankees, get you the five things you need to know from that one. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Pro Baseball GM. It is quite possibly the coolest game I've played in a long time, and especially the coolest game that I've played on my phone, because I always thought I could be a great Major League GM, but it turns out it's not that easy. And I know for a lot of people, you know, they bank on fantasy baseball being the chance to kind of be a GM, but Ultimate Baseball GM goes much deeper than fantasy baseball. You play the game on your phone, download the app, you, you take over a team, and you hire coaches and staff. You manage team finances, you're scouting and drafting players, and you're managing difficult personalities, injuries as well, just navigating your whole franchise through free agency, the draft, the trade deadline and everything that goes into a season. And Ultimate Baseball GM, it's completely free and playable offline. Doesn't drain your battery. You can play on the go and play wherever you want to as well. And Orioles fans, jump in there. You can compete against other O's fans. And you don't need Wi-Fi to play. Just in-app play. It's very fun. And it is a very realistic and challenging game world as well. And Locked On Orioles listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probaseballgm.com. Scan the code or look it up in the app stores. That's probaseballgm.com. Ultimate Baseball GM. Start your dynasty today. And this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Rocket Money. Rocket Money is, you know, a place where, hey, did you discover any subscriptions you forgot about? Did Rocket Money maybe cancel a subscription? Well, it can do that for you. Because when you think about the things you're spending your money on, sometimes you just forget what you are subscribed to. But Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people had subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're one of them. I know I'm one of them. And over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. So stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. That's rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. Rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. So we're taking a look back at the Orioles and the Yankees, a three-game series in Baltimore this weekend as the O's won the home opener Friday, but dropped the next two games to drop the series, lost four to one, then five to three, and now four and five on the young 2023 season. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 5-3 to three loss to the Yankees on Sunday. And the first thing you need to know on the positive side, Adley Rutschman absolutely owned the day in this one. Of course, it was a day game after a night game for the Orioles. We knew Adley was not going to catch, but he was in the lineup as the DH hitting second for the Orioles. And the Yankees did not get him out. Adley Rutschman, four for four with a home run, an RBI, and two runs scored in this game. Now, to be fair... He did have kind of three bloop-ish singles from the right side early in the game. But then he absolutely had a monster home run as well in the eighth inning. It was a solo shot. 
that made it a 5-3 to three game. So we kind of did it all in this one. That ball off the bat of Rutschman, 108.3 off the bat, 408 feet out to right field for the home run. Yankees just couldn't get him out. He continued to be a dominant player. I mean, when you add in the fact that he got on base three out of four times on Saturday, he gets on base seven out of eight times in the last two games this weekend, yet the Orioles score four combined runs. He was basically trying to carry the load himself. Rutschman now hitting 389 with a 1032 OPS on the young season through nine games. He is certainly carrying his side of the bargain right now for the Orioles. And for Adley Rutschman, first Oriole ever since the team became the Orioles in 1954 to have two four-plus hit games within his team's first nine games of a season. Pretty impressive by Adley Rutschman. Second thing you need to know from this one is that Ryan Mountcastle, well, he had a 2022 Ryan Mountcastle-like day in this one. Had a one for four with a double in this game. It was a a big double that set up the two-run six for the Orioles. But I think Ryan Mountcastle felt like he should have had a three for four in this game. One for four with a double, a strikeout, and a run scored. But Mountcastle had three hard-hit balls. And the two batted ball outs, along with his double as well, were all hard-hit balls for Mountcastle and he hit one ball to left field that would have been a home run in the old dimensions of the ballpark he hit a ball to right field that got to the warning track but didn't quite get out the two flyouts were hit at 107 and 106 miles per hour off the bat both of them traveled over 340 feet both of them had an expected batting average above 460 That's just annoying for Ryan Mountcastle. And quite frankly, that is what most of his 2022 season looked like. Just unlucky, unlucky, unlucky. He was unlucky again at Camden Yards. You could see him have some words to himself after that flyout in the fourth inning that went to left field that would have been a home run in the old ballpark. Yeah, he's still frustrated, and it's tough to see him continue to have days like that. Third thing you need to know from this one, sticking with the bats, is that the Orioles... I mean, they really didn't score much. It was one run on four hits on Saturday. It was three runs on six hits on Sunday. But at the very least, Rutschman was good. Mountcastle was hitting it hard. And Anthony Santander finally came up with a big hit. I mentioned the Rutschman solo homer in the eighth inning. The only other two runs for the Orioles came on an Anthony Santander two-run double in the sixth inning as he roped one down the right field line. He also walked in this game in a one for three. That made it a four to two game. At the time, it was right after Nestor Cortez had left the game and Santander with the double off of Albert Abreu to put the Orioles back in the game. Santander has struggled so far this year, hitting just 194 on the season, still without a home run after being the Orioles' home run leader last year with 33 bombs. But it was nice to see him rope that double. Maybe that gets Santander back into the groove and starting to swing it well because the Orioles need him to do so in the middle of that order. Fourth thing you need to know as we move to the pitching side, Tyler Wells had, I would say, an up-and-down start in his first start of the season for the Orioles. Of course, it was his second appearance after he came in in emergency relief on Monday night in Texas and threw five scoreless, hitless innings against the Rangers after Kyle Bradish left in the second inning with injury. Wells' final line, six innings. He allowed four runs on six hits with six strikeouts and no walks. Did allow two home runs on the day, throwing 89 pitches And the Yankees did end up with eight hard hit balls in those six innings against Tyler Wells. He was very efficient. Just 89 pitches in six innings is good. The bad part was the long ball. Aaron Judge hit a monster home run against him in the third. And who else but Franchi Cordero hit a two run shot off of him in the fifth that gave the Yankees a four nothing lead at the time. Is it annoying that Franchi Cordero hit two home runs in this series and they were two pretty big home runs? Yes, of course. It is very, very annoying because the Orioles had him in spring training and could have put him on the roster. But Tyler Wells, otherwise, I was pretty impressed. I mean, six strikeouts to no walks. That's what we saw a lot from Wells as a starter in 2022. I mean, basically didn't walk anybody last season. He mixed the pitches. He threw six different pitches, four-seamer, cutter, changeup, curveball, slider, sweeper. He threw them all in this game. And, you know, he was mixing them well, 28 four-seamers, 22 cutters, 18 change-ups, 14 curveballs, had 11 whiffs on the day, four of them on the cutter, which is kind of his new pitch, threw it, you know, 88 to 90, and I was really impressed by that pitch from Tyler Wells. Spin rates were good, velocity was solid. Yeah, the home runs hurt him, but the home runs hurt him at times last year. I liked what I saw overall in the first start from Tyler Wells. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 5-3 to loss to the Yankees on Sunday is that 
it's back-to-back rough outings now for Logan Gillespie, who presumably made the team as the final arm out of the bullpen for the Orioles. And his first few outings were big outs, and he looked good for Baltimore, especially in those outings in Boston in the first weekend. But his last two, both in this series, have not been good. Got roughed up in the sixth inning on Friday, gave up the lead to the Yankees. Then Gillespie came into this game, and things just kind of continued to get worse for Gillespie, who was charged with one run on two hits over an inning and a third with a walk, a strikeout, and a home run allowed. He also allowed a solo home run to Aaron Judge in this game. Five hard-hit balls against Logan Gillespie in this game. That right there is a little bit concerning when you think about the fact that uh, he only faced seven batters and five balls were hit hard. The stuff, he kind of didn't have any command. He was really lucky to get out of the inning that he did. Yeah, I'm a little worried. And again, he's the last arm in the bullpen, but the O's need Michael Givens and, and Dylan Tate back because some of these guys they're having to count on are not the best arms out of the bullpen. So it did become a series loss for the O's, losing the last two games, now four and five on the year. The good point, and the thing you can look forward to, though, is that that was kind of the tough early stretch in the schedule. Now, the easy April comes to the Orioles. And I talked about this during the offseason that the Orioles month of April was by far the easiest month on the schedule. And it started a little tough with Boston, Texas, and New York. But now the easy schedule comes because they open up tonight a four-game series at home against the 2-7 and seven Oakland Athletics, who are basically a AAA team. And in the next 22 games, they play Oakland, the White Sox, who are struggling, the Nationals, maybe the worst team in baseball, the Tigers, maybe the second worst team in baseball. They play Boston, who could be worse than the O's. They play the Tigers again, and then the Kansas City Royals, who are one of the worst teams in baseball. That's the next 22 games for the Orioles leading into the first week of May. If you can get a 14-8 and eight stretch there, you're at 18 and 13 on the year in early May, and you're feeling good, and you're in a much better spot than the Orioles were when they went 7 and 14 in April last season. It's an easy April. You got to take advantage, and hopefully they start that tonight. But one guy who won't be around to try and help kickstart the Orioles again as they start playing some, I'd say, weaker competition is Kyle Stowers, who was surprisingly sent to AAA as part of a roster move before Sunday's game. And coming up next, I'm going to break down that move a little bit further because instead of keep Stowers around, who is still a promising young hitter, the Orioles decided to carry three catchers kind of for no reason. Well, try to figure out a reason coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by So Rare. So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. And unlike other fantasy baseball platforms, so rare managers truly own their fantasy experience, collecting, buying, selling, and competing with player cards against global opponents to win epic rewards. And win or lose, you still own your cards, and there's really no cost to play. And so rare they have competitions as well. The MOB game weeks happen twice weekly. And at the end of game weeks, so rare MOB managers who rank at or near the top of the leaderboards can win a variety of awesome rewards like scarcity cards, game tickets, merchandise, signed jerseys, and VIP experiences like meeting MLB stars. So head to so rare.com slash locked on. That's spelled S O R A R E dot com. To draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's so rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. So the Orioles dropped the final two games of the series to the Yankees, now four and five on the year. But before they did officially drop the series on Sunday before the game, we got a somewhat interesting roster move from the Orioles. Now, we knew James McCann was getting ready to return to the O's. The Orioles traded for him from the Mets this offseason, and it was pretty much penciled in that McCann would be the backup catcher to Adley Rutschman. But McCann, who did have a somewhat serious oblique injury during the 2022 season in New York, felt some pain in his side late in spring training. They decided to be cautious because he'd had an oblique injury before, and so McCann started the year on the 10-day IL. Anthony Benboom made the team as Rutschman's backup catcher. Benboom started one game. 
for the Orioles. And then, you know, McCann had played the last two nights in Aberdeen on rehab games. And we figured if not Sunday, probably Monday or Tuesday, McCann would rejoin the Orioles. And well, the Orioles decided he was ready Sunday morning to come back. You knew Rutschman wasn't going to start. Sunday's game with it being a day game after a night game. So it kind of made sense. Hey, you get McCann back, you get him in the starting lineup on a Sunday game against a left-handed pitcher as well. It was kind of a perfect time to bring him back. And everyone assumed rightfully that, you know, Anthony Benboom would be DFA'd to make room for James McCann because, well, the Orioles only need two catchers, especially when you have maybe the best catcher in baseball and Adley Rutschman as your starter. So we all expected the McCann for Benboom swap to be the roster move, but that wasn't the case. And to be honest, I'm still a little confused about this move. The Orioles instead optioned Kyle Stowers down to AAA Norfolk to make room for James McCann. Now, McCann started on Sunday, went 0 for 2 behind the plate, got pinch hit 4 in the 7th inning, but did have two hard hit balls and caught a nice game behind the dish. Did what we thought he would do as the Orioles' backup catcher. But it's not really about James McCann. He was going to be on this roster either way once he was healthy. It's about... Sticking with Anthony Bemboom and sticking with three catchers on the roster instead of Kyle Stowers. Now, I had two initial thoughts to this move. My first thought was specifically in keeping three catchers. And my thought was maybe Adley Rutschman is a little banged up. Not bad enough where he has to go on the injured list or anything. Not bad enough where he you know, even has to sit. You know, Clearly, he DH'd and had four hits on Sunday. He's mostly good. But maybe there's something there, just a little bit of uh, some nicks, some bruises, something that maybe he can't catch for the next couple of days. That was my thought. Because if you have Adley there and he can't catch, you're probably going to DH him. And if you really don't want to catch him, you're probably going to want two other catchers on the roster. So that was my first thought that maybe he's a little banged up. They're not going to catch him for a few days. They want to make sure they're okay and have two other catchers. So they're going to carry McCann and Ben Boom for a couple of days. Then when Adley frees up, he'll go back to catching. That still could be the case because we haven't seen a, a lineup yet for Monday that would show that, oh, he's back there catching. So it could be the case. But if that were the case, it's interesting that Kyle Stowers goes down to AAA. That's the other part of this. Kyle Stowers, just kind of a tough start to the season for him. Last year, 98 MLB plate appearances, had a 724 OPS. He was solid, solid in the field, solid at the plate, had some strikeout issues, but obviously hit that huge home run against the White Sox, had some big hits for the Orioles. And he makes the team out of spring training. I think we all knew, or at least you should have known, he wasn't going to play every day. The Orioles had outfielders in Mullins, Santander, and Hayes. They wanted to get out there. But we figured Stowers would be in and out of the lineup, especially against righties. He'd be in there sometimes. But through eight games before the Orioles optioned him on Sunday morning, he had started one game. Started one game in Texas last week. He had a couple pinch hitting appearances, but had barely seen the field, was 0 for 4 with two walks. Did pinch hit. In the ninth inning of Saturday's game, drew a four-pitch walk against Yankees closer Clay Holmes, was the only guy to reach base in Holmes' two outings and his two saves this weekend against the Orioles. And that's what Brandon Hyde, I think, likes about him. He's talked about it before, how he can draw a walk as well, despite some strikeout issues at times. And he's got big power. And he's not amazing defensively in the outfield, but he's solid. It just makes you wonder why the Sowers move was made. And I do think, looking back, with, as I mentioned earlier, Taron Vavra getting the start in right field, hitting ninth for the Orioles in Saturday's lineup, that was kind of the writing on the wall. I mean, if you're not going to play Stowers, you're going to play Vavra out there in that situation. You're clearly setting your team up to, to not have Kyle Stowers on it. And so they send him down to AAA, and there's the argument for, all right, you know, he's not getting consistent at-bats. Let's get him consistent at-bats in AAA because we know we can get him that. I don't know if Kyle Stowers is going to benefit from consistent at-bats in AAA at this point. He has 500 career AAA plate appearances. He's got over an 850 OPS in his career with the Norfolk Tides. I just feel like, yeah, maybe it's a little better to play every day if you're not going to in the big leagues. But I just feel like at that point, you've done everything you can at AAA and you just got to be in the big leagues. You just have to be in the big leagues at that point. And maybe that doesn't mean playing every day, and that's okay. But the Orioles clearly see something here that they don't like with Kyle Stowers. 
And, you know, I hear the arguments too, like, well, if Brandon Hyde's not going to play him, Mike Elias better send him down. No, 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 no. Do not think for a second that Brandon Hyde is like going AWOL and is, you know, just acting as a rogue agent and benching Kyle Stowers because he has some vendetta against him. That's silly. It's 2023 in Major League Baseball. Managers do not set the line. Some of them have a hand in it. Some of them mostly set it. Some of them don't do anything at all in terms of the lineup. They just get handed the lineup by people in the front office. It sounds like the Orioles have some sort of mix where Hyde and the front office come together and come to a kind of consensus lineup every day. But it's not just Brandon Hyde writing in the lineup. And Hyde's going to get to veto some things, but the front office is going to have some final say and some things as well when it comes to the Orioles lineup every day. It's just how baseball works in 2023. So at this point, you know that Mike Elias and his staff are seeing something there, whether it's the swing and miss and Stowers swing, whether it's the fact that, you know, even though he hit lefties well in the minors, they don't like how he, you know, faces a breaking ball from a lefty. One big hole in his swing is kind of the back foot slider against a right-hander for Kyle Stowers. Those pitches get thrown to him time and time again, and he cannot lay off. He's been behind fastballs at times. I would still like him in the big leagues, though, to play two or three days a week because he's got power and I like his game. I don't think his defense is terrible. But whether they don't like his swing or they're really worried about the defense or some sort of combination, there's something the front office sees that they don't like and they want to try and sort it out with more plate appearances playing every single day in AAA Norfolk. And they feel like with McKenna as the defensive guy and with Vavra's ability to play the outfield and Adam Frazier can play the outfield a little bit, you still have Hayes, Santander, and Mullins. They feel like they have those positions covered. And I'm assuming they feel like they're going to be benefited more by carrying a third catcher. Now, James McCann can maybe DH against some lefties, and he's played first base in his time, so he gives you a little versatility there. I mean, Anthony Benboom is just a catcher, and he certainly can't hit, but you have Adley as a switch hitter, and then you have Benboom as a left-handed hitter, and McCann as a right-handed hitter, so that gives you a little versatility at catcher. But if Adley is not banged up, it's just weird to have the three catchers because, yeah, I, I get you get the versatility, but Adley Rutschman at worst is the second best catcher in baseball behind JT Real Muto. And by the end of this year, he may be number one. And he's going to play, not at a Real Muto rate, but he's going to be probably top 10 among catchers in games play because that's how good he is. You don't need two backups. And it's not like Ryan Mountcastle struggling mightily where you need to put James McCann out there at first base a lot. You don't need to do that either. And DH is going to be filled by Santander and a rotating cast of others. I don't understand the three catchers. So I, I, I guess if Ben Boom gets sent down today or tomorrow and the Orioles call up a Ryan O'Hearn or a Josh Lester type or even a Jordan Westberg, I'll get it more. I'll understand where this move is coming from. Maybe they just felt like they wanted the three catchers for a couple of days and then make the move. But if they sit with three catchers for a while, it just feels like they're not utilizing that roster spot because – the versatility of James McCann should make it easier to carry just two catchers. The fact that he can play a little first base, then you can open up that third spot for someone else. The Orioles have also never carried a third catcher behind Adley. Since they called Adley up last May, they have only had two catchers on the roster. It's either been Robinson Torinos was his backup all of last year, and then Ben Boom was his backup for the first eight games this year until they activated McCann and had the three catchers for Sunday's game, and they used all three of them. Adley was the DH. McCann started behind the plate. McCann got pinch hit four in the seventh, and then Ben Boom caught, came in and caught the final two innings. So they did use all three of them in the game. It was maybe a little helpful to have that third catcher, but it did take away a roster spot. And when the Orioles came up down five to three in the bottom of the ninth against Clay Holmes, they had six, seven, eight due up in the order. And the ninth guy due up was Anthony Ben Boom. And because they had used pinch hitters already, the only hitter they had left on the bench was Ryan McKenna. And if the Orioles got any base runner up, it would have been that spot due up with a tying run at the plate with two outs in the ninth. And you had to choose between Anthony Bemboom and Ryan McKenna. Now the Orioles went down one, two, three. Hyde didn't have to make the decision, but that's two guys you really don't have faith in hitting a homer, let alone getting a hit. It would be nice to have maybe Kyle Stowers available in that scenario. So I just feel like this move doesn't make the major league team better. And it falls into this continued category for the Orioles this season of we're still focusing more on the future of the O's than the 2023 Orioles, or at least the Orioles at this very moment. That's what it feels like for me. And the other thing is you can't just replace. I, I saw some people say, oh, they'll just call up another pitcher on Monday to replace Ben Boom. You can't do that. 
you can only carry 13 pitchers and 13 hitters. That's how you have to construct your roster now. Right now, they have 13 pitchers and 13 hitters. So if they do still send Ben Boom down, it has to be a position player that they replace him with. And again, if it's O'Hearn or Lester or Westberg, I get it. It somewhat makes sense. If you think those guys help you more off the bench than Stowers does. But if they carry the three catchers for a while, you have Adley Rutschman. And unless he's banged up, I just, I don't understand at this point. I, I, as I laid out, I get some of the reasons they could have for doing it. And obviously they did do it. So they have a reason. I just don't agree. And I, I kind of just don't get it at this point. So hopefully here on Monday, we'll get some more answers. If Adley's a little banged up, if they make another move for a different hitter, if there's something going on with Stowers, we find out more of, maybe we'll get more information. And of course, I'll have it for you coming up on tomorrow's episode. And also I'll have for you a recap of game one between the Orioles and the Oakland Athletics. A big chance for the O's to get back on track here. Four games at home against Oakland, who they're 2-7, and seven, and they might just be the worst, at least the worst roster in all of baseball right now. In the Monday night game, a 635 start. Kyle Gibson goes for the Orioles, looking to build off his strong start in Texas. And the young left-hander, J.P. Sears, goes for the Athletics in Game 1. And again, I'll be back tomorrow on the pod to break down and recap Game 1 and talk a little bit more about this kind of roster weirdness happening with the Orioles. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.